conference in 1978 in, in San Francisco. It was at the Fairmont, and we were debating, well, there were 400 scientists in the, in the conference. 14 of them were Nobel Prize winners. Uh, in one slippery session, slippery topic at least, we were debating the f feasibility of extraterrestrial intelligence. How many of you in this room believe that extraterrestrial intelligence exists? Very good. How many of you believe terrestrial intelligence exists? <laughs> I live in Fredericksburg, just 50 miles south of Washington, and there's very little evidence in Washington, at least, that there is this terrestrial intelligence. But at the conference, in this one session of 80 people, all 14 were there, and we were discussing this slippery topic, the feasibility of extraterrestrial intelligence. Now, the Hubble telescope had not been sent into orbit yet, and we had, we had no evidence for other planets or other solar systems. We were playing a game, sort of, uh, we were speaking about the Drake seven factor formula, which gives you a handle on the probability of life. Uh, for example, we live near, near a star called the G2 type, and it'll survive for, uh, for it'll live for about 10 billion years. We're halfway into this period, and it's given its, its uh, planets, at least at this distance from the sun, a chance to evolve life. So, with these factors, we try to get a fa a, a, an idea on the probability. The probability turns out to be about 10 to the minus 6, which is 1 in a million, but we live in a galaxy of 400 billion stars. If you multiply 4 times 10 to the 11 times 10 to the minus 6, you obtain 4 times 10 to the 5. There should be 400,000 intelligent civilizations right now, completely uh, independent of us. So this is what we were talking about, and the speaker gave made a, a point about how nebulous these factors were. I got up to a microphone to, to offer my five cents worth, but right in front of me was Israel's greatest physicist, Yuval Neyman, and right behind me were two Nobel Prize winners. There was uh, Sir John Eccles who had invited me in the first place, and behind him was Eugene Wigner from Princeton, who's been a hero and a mentor for, for decades. And I wanted to sit down. I had something so inconsequential to say, I thought I, was, I shouldn't even be up there. Except Eccles was holding on to my jacket, and he said, Adelaide, we want to hear a youthful opinion. And certainly 30 years ago, I was much more youthful and more opinionated. <laughs> I went to sit down. And you all name on said, about these factors, he said, this is just like a story in my country, in Israel. He said, a woman goes to a doctor and says, I'm really worried, this is number five. The physician says, you have nothing to fear. She says, you don't understand, this is number five. This goes back and forth until she says, you keep missing the point. According to statistics, every fifth child born is born Chinese. 21% <laughs> of the population is Chinese, so this is correct. He gave me the microphone. I had forgotten what I got up to say in the first place. <laughs> Fortunately, just, just a few weeks earlier, I was in a doctor's office in Oxford, and there was a copy of The Lancet sitting in front of me. And there was a story about the fifth child. So I said, a woman goes to her doctor, she's pregnant for the fifth time. People started looking for an echo. It was exactly the same <coughs> prologue as, uh, as Yuval Neyman had used, but this was a true story. And I'll let you vote on this as I asked the 80 people in that room to vote. The woman is suffering from tuberculosis. Her husband has a social disease. The first four children were born blind, stillborn, deaf and dumb, and the fourth one has tuberculosis. Now it's time for the fifth child. You, as the family physician, has to advise this woman. Who says, have the baby anyway? <coughs> if you don't vote, it means you don't care. Let me ask you. <laughs> Who says, have the baby anyway? Who says, this is a dubious case, maybe you should uh, not have the child. Who says, 
I asked Johns Hopkins, there's 400 physicians, and most of them, they said, don't have the baby. Well, in this case, the baby was born. 65, I think, uh, three quarters of the group at, uh, in California, when I asked the question, said, this is a time to terminate. The baby was born, it was Ludwig von Beethoven. And I've felt guilty ever since. I worshipped Beethoven's music and I had terminated Beethoven when I was first reading that story. <laughs> right after the session, uh, Yuval Neyman, the Israeli, came up to me and he said, that's an anecdote, he said. Uh, try this one. You can't really do statistics with anecdotes, obviously. He said, a woman goes to her doctor, she's pregnant for the first time, she's in her mid-40s, her husband is about 60, it's the first child. She tells the doctor also that she's married to a distant cousin. Except there's a little lie there. She's married to her uncle. <laughs> Who says, have the baby? Who says, don't have the baby? Not too many hands here. <laughs> well, this was Adolf Hitler. <laughs> but again, it's an anecdote. And you can't do statistics with anecdotes. And the last story, a very quick story. A 15-year-old girl gets pregnant, her boyfriend is 24. I won't ask you to vote on this. Uh, marriage is out of the question for socioeconomic reasons. The child is born. The date is April the 15th, 1452. And the child, of course, is Leonardo. He was illegitimate. The first five years of his life, he lived with his mother, a woman named Katerina and the peasant Katrina married. And then uh, the father, Ser Piero Antonio, uh, realizing that his own wife was, was uh, uh, fertile in the language of the day, uh, came and took the child, and for the next 10 years, the child lived with the father's family. Uh, when the boy was about 15, the family moved from Vinci to Florence, where Leonardo, an illegitimate child, was was uh, apprenticed to Ser Piero and to uh, Verrocchio. Verrocchio was quite simply the finest fit for Leonardo then. He was always also legitimate, and he had a very simple dictum, learn from nature, and when you paint, build the body from the inside out. First, put, plant the bones and the muscles, and then the clothes on the muscles. This was the idea. It really, truly taught Leonardo to practice this entire, his entire life. But he had no idea to what levels Leonardo would go to learn anatomy, for example. Uh, during those post-mortems, those anatomical studies, in those fetid conditions, he must have been paying more, uh, mortuaries to get to those bodies. And he claimed he did about 30 uh, anatomical studies. He was the greatest artist doing science. He was the greatest scientist doing art. He's one of these transformative genius.